Welcome to Private Equity Profits. Clifford Locks is a certified board of director, a trusted confidant to CEOs, C-level exec, and high potential employees to help them clarify goals, unlock their potential, and create actionable strategic plans. Seth Green is the nation's foremost authority on growing your business. He is the founder of the direct response marketing firm, Market Domination LLC, and he is an eight-time best-selling author who has been interviewed on NBC, CBS, Forbes, Inc., CBS Money Watch, and many more. Cliff and Seth interview top players in the financial sector, focusing on private equity and real estate funds, discussing developments, and trends shaping the industry. These experts will share with you how they've leveraged the power of equity funding to grow their businesses and increase profits, and how you can too. And now, here's your host, Seth Green. Welcome to the podcast. This is your co-host, Seth Green. Today, I have the good fortune to be joined by John Jennings, President and Chief Strategist of the St. Louis Trust Company. John, thanks so much for joining us. Uh, I'm super happy to be here. So, I'm All right. So for our folks watching and listening, tell us about the St. Louis Company, St. Louis Trust Company. What do you guys do and who do you serve? Yeah, so we are a multifamily office started about 19 years ago out of the ashes of Arthur Anderson. So, you know, I worked at Arthur Anderson for about four years. And when it was imploding in the wake of the Enron scandal, I was like, oh, this is horrible. But looking back selfishly, you know, personally for us, and I, I think uh, other people that were there, it worked out really well. So, so being a multifamily office, we work with 60 client families and we have 55 employees. So nearly a one to one ratio. That is awesome. That's a, yeah, that's a great ratio. Yeah. So what is it that you think makes the St. Louis Trust Company, other than the ratio, obviously stand out and how do you differentiate yourselves? Yeah. So um, kind of to borrow from Peter Thiel, the venture capitalist, you know, he had this great book, uh, Zero to One and other, other venture capitalists have talked about this, like truly successful companies need to have a secret. And the definition of a secret in, in their parlance is, what do you believe that most other people or businesses don't believe? And if you told them, they, you'd think that it's sort of crazy. So in pretty much every business, but especially financial services, there's a trade-off between customization and scalability. And the goal for most businesses, almost all of them in the financial services industry, is to increase scale. So for instance, we work with 60 client families and, and oversee and advise on about $13 billion of assets with 55 employees. So imagine just the profits if we double that to 120 and 26 billion with the same 55 employees. We'd be like, where do we stack all our Benjamins, right? <laughs> um, what our secret is, is we believe that if you are as customized as possible and you don't scale, that that's a great business and you can be profitable and you can really be among the best in the entire country or entire world, which would mean the entire solar system. And I don't go further than that because who knows what else is out there, right? So that, that is an excellent point. Yeah. So we want to be as close as possible for our client families to a single family office. And we're able to do that because we're 60% owned by clients. So um, the main, you know, our, our main ownership group, you know, well, it's kind of nice when, you know, they, they're, they get a nice dividend. Uh, the number one thing is they want us to be customized and serve their families well. All right. So that could, that, that's very interesting. Talk a little bit more about the, and that's probably another thing that differentiates you. Talk a little bit about the ownership structure. Yeah, so um, when, when we started, we decided to be a trust company and um, you know, we, we needed working capital, but we also needed capital to be a trust company. And so we turned up, you know, we turned to our initial set of clients. So they were, they were early investors in the company. And as we've grown, um, we've had uh, some other clients that have, have bought in and we are overseen by a board that is all you know, all but two of us are, uh, uh, you know, clients on our board. And um, 
So, you know, clients that are on our board uh, buy in and, and it's, it's really, it, it's really great. Uh, the other 40% is owned by, uh, you know, our, our primary founder owns a chunk, chunk who's now retired and the rest is principals of our firm. So. And obviously we're not asking you to break confidentiality to disclose, disclose any names, but what types of families do you work with? Yeah. So who, who is an ideal client for you? Uh, so it's interesting. So if you, if you look at the size of our clients, you know, I, I don't believe we have anyone that just made a lot of income. Like we don't have any wealth generators that are doctors or lawyers, and we don't really have anybody that just saved money and invested in the stock market. Really, really to create great wealth, you have to have equity in a single company usually. So you put together your you know, you've taken a big risk, you've been concentrated, you put your own sweat equity into it, and you get lucky. <laughs> so um, our client families, somebody did that, whether we're working with a first generation, or, you know, we've worked, we have sixth and seventh generation we work with. So they, they either started a company, and then over time, it was was sold. And sometimes they start multiple. Um, or they were an executive at a public company and, and were, was able to buy in or be granted a lot of equity. So that's who our clients are or their descendants. What are you finding some of the biggest mistakes they're making are that they're coming to you to help fix or that they want to help your help to avoid? Yeah, you, you know, we get, a, we get a quite a few client families interested in us that realize that they need a higher level of customization and service. And really at this, the sort of wealth, uh, the wealthy families that, you know, kind of the, the waters we're swimming in, you know, kind of use a shark reference. So yeah, it's a, there's a lot of, there's a lot of sharks out there, but um, the, the level of wealth we're, we're dealing with, there, there's no real just platform they can be on. So if you go to a lot of investment firms, they're like, okay, here's the way we do things. And the family needs to fit into how we do things. And we flip that on its head. We say, you know, we're going to help you invest and do everything else in your lives the way that fits your values and your goals, right? So that's, that's number one. And, and number two, we, we see a lot of client families have just really been burnt in the financial industry. Even if they're working with, you know, some of the really big name, you know, kind of gold standard firms, they just feel like, you know, the desire is the firm the investment firm just throwing things at them, just trying to sell them. And it's all about their profitability, the, the investment firm, rather than what the family needs. And so we, we often come in, they may still work with that firm, but they're like, okay, we need somebody to help us to look at all this stuff and say, okay, this makes sense, that doesn't. And we really start focusing on fees and taxes and things that the investment industry really doesn't like to talk about. Okay, so you seg you you segued into the next question perfectly. So, what are the services that you offer beyond the traditional um, investment management that they're attracted to that go beyond that Main Street offering? Right. So, you know, one of the we have three main lines. One of the three is um, you know investment management, and you know we do a nice job of investment management, but you can find good investment managers all over the place. The second thing we do is family office. And I think a great thing, and we, we sort of, you know, we started in 2002 and we rode this wave where, uh, you know, people didn't know what a family office or a multifamily office was, you know, nearly 20 years ago. And so we really rode this wave where we're, we were sort of early. And I think what's great for investors is pretty much every, you know, financial advisory firm or investment firm out there says, okay, we're going to provide some family office service. And I think that's great. But it's hard to do if you have 100, you know, every advisor works on 100 or you know, 150, 200, 200 um, accounts. So the way we do family office is each of our professionals only works with, you know, five to seven families. So it really allows you to dig in and do bill pay and cash flow and help with charitable planning and educate kids, you know, the next generations about wealth and put together a strategy and on and on and on and on. I mean, there's just all these, these ones off, you know, um, private jet charter and, uh, you know, should I lease or buy my car? Or, you know, I'm the next generation, I'm starting a business, can you help me on that? And, and we do all that. And then the third line of business is we can either be trustee, which is a really a convenience for our clients, there's different reasons they may need a trustee, or they have a, have a corporate trustee that's, you know, some big institution that they don't feel like they're a fit with anymore, and they can move to us. But probably a bigger thing is, is a lot of family members service trustee for trusts, 
and um, you know partnerships and things like that. And we help them be good trustees or you know managers of their LLC and do all the legwork behind uh, the, the scenes and, and and there's liability. You know I I uh, you know there's there's all these cases you hear uh, you know both around where I live and nationwide about you know families sue each other and there's there's real liability when you're trustee of a family um, family trust. So we help them with with that. And by the way, real quick, you know, even though our name is St. Louis Trust, and we've, we're actually in the middle of rebranding to St. Louis Trust and Family Office. So it hasn't really been released yet. But um, we have clients in 33 states. And some, some, you know, family members live out of out of the US. And, you know, our biggest growth areas have actually been on the coast. So um, notwithstanding our name, we are not a local organization. We are nationwide. Understood. Now you talked about a lot of the majority of the families be having at some point in their history, there was a business that was started, perhaps there's some liquidity event or something that qualifies them to have the cash to work with a multifamily office like yours. How are you helping them? Because I mean, there's stereotypes and cliches of shirt sleeves to shirt sleeves in three generations and how many businesses don't make it past generation three. How are you helping them bridge that gap? Yeah, um, that is that is a real issue, and really, what drives shirt sleeve to shirt sleeves, and you know, three or four or five, you, you hear it stated different ways, is is a big part of that is math. So I'll, I'll give you an example. So there's a client family we work with. with it's you know, I think the main um, the main ones we work with are you know, depending on how you count it, fifth or sixth generation. And if you look at their, you know, this this generation's grandmother. So the grandmother and the grandfather, so they had a big chunk of wealth. And then they had six kids and they paid a state tax. So the six kids then had one sixth of the wealth, less tax. And so the, grand, the, 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 the grandparents lived amazingly well. Like they had just money just flowing in. The six kids also very wealthy, lived well, but it was a step down, right? <laughs> and then those six kids, it varies between having um, two to six kids for each of those six kids. And then that drops down and there was a state tax. So a lot of it is math that, it, you know, even, even if you invest well and, and you control your spending, you know, some of it's just math. And where we see some families not go shirt sleeve to shirt sleeve. Some of it is just because they don't have as many descendants. So if the grandparents had one child who turned out had two children, you know, you can out earn that math. So part of it is just looking at the math and setting expectations and just telling a lower generation, by the way, you know, even when all the money flows down to you, just because of the math, you probably can't live as your parents did. And you definitely can't live as your grandparents did. So that's the first thing. So some of it's just, it is what it is. Um, the second thing is, is uh, fees and taxes are huge. So limiting fees and taxes is, is, is really important. Um, investing well, and investing well isn't just always, okay, I'm going to go out and, you know, I'm going to find the next Facebook while it's private or beyond meat or, you know, whatever, and it's, you know, Tesla and SpaceX is going to be all this, this growth. I mean, that's great, but that's really hard to do. Part of it is, just not making big investment mistakes. That's, that's, that's a big deal. And then estate planning. So the way the estate tax laws are in, in wealth transfer tax laws are now, um, you know, paying estate tax is largely optional if you plan early and often and you're willing to do what it takes. And we've seen this time and time again, people that have tens of millions of projected estate tax liability and 10 or 20 late, years later, it's, it's zero. So, um, you know, we'll see what the, the future tax laws hold, but it, it really is optional. And all the time we see people that wait till they're their 60s or 70s or have a family owned business and they've done little estate planning and it can just be devastating, again, in terms of the math and how that, that passes down. So that was a long answer. I could talk more on it, but I think that's <laughs> it's probably pretty good. How has the COVID pandemic um, affected your business and your clients? Um, if you would have told me 18 months ago that this was going to happen, we were going to have this pandemic and we're going to have to work, work virtually and we couldn't visit even our clients that live locally because of, of health concerns, um, I, I would have been like, okay, this is just going to be devastating. And what has been surprising is how well it's gone. 
So we've been able to, we transitioned remotely, you know, over a three day period last March and our people have just done a great job, um, you know, meeting with our clients virtually and staying in contact with them. You know, we call them a lot. We have video calls. It's gone really well. Now I will tell you that my analogy I use is both in terms of our company culture and working together and client relationships. I felt like we were running on battery power. So it was working but I felt like the battery was degrading and draining over time. Right. And I wouldn't want to do this for, you know, two years or five years. And we are, you know, with the, the vaccines and almost everybody in our company is vaccinated. More people are coming back to the office. We're bringing them, you know, everybody's going to start coming back to the office more uh, the day after summer solstice. So we didn't want to interfere with summer solstice celebrations, but it's going to be the day after the, the summer solstice. We're traveling to meet clients. We're meeting them in person. Uh, it's really fantastic to see everybody again, but again, I, I was just stunned that there wasn't more of a, of a di disruption in how well it went. And I just think about, man, what if this was, you know, even 10 or 15 years ago and we didn't have all the technology we do, it would just be a far different situation. Absolutely. How has it changed the investment advice you're giving your clients? Um, I don't, it, it really hasn't. It, it really hasn't. Um, you know, going in, even going into the pandemic, um, you, you know, we're big on, on the belief that, you know, the financial industry models risk and returns using the standard bell curve or the normal distribution, the Gaussian distribution. That doesn't work. The, that math does not work. You cannot take projections and, and say, oh, well, this is your downside risk or this is what's going to happen. Um, so we're, we're very big on investing acknowledging the uncertainty of the future, part of that means having an adequate margin of safety. And so when we hit the nearly 35% down in just over 30 days, so, you know, the 30% the, uh, the, uh, down that occurred in, um, it was the fastest drop in the stock market ever, even faster than some of the times in 1929 and 1930. So um, really no, none of our clients panicked. And um, some of them rebalanced and really rode the, the, the up, you know, sold high or, uh, you know, take, took liquidity and, and bought low things. So, you know, they, re they really did quite well uh, or did fine through it. Now, if it had gone instead of 34% down or if it had gone 70% down, yeah, that would have been, a, <laughs> you know, it would have been, it would have been more difficult, but it just really reminds you just the folly of trying to forecast what investment returns are. And a lot of the industry says, okay, well, you know, and I did a, I, I am also a contributor for Forbes. And I, I wrote an article, I've wrote a few, I've written a few articles kind of lambasting this idea that you can predict. And a common excuse that people give when they predict is, well, I couldn't have foreseen that. Like I could, I didn't know that there was going to be a pandemic or that, you know, going back that, you know, 4% of the mortgage market of some primes would be one of the main things that led to, you know, unraveled the, you know, the entire financial system almost, or, you know, who had on their, their, their scorecard for 2021, that a boat would get stuck in the Suez Canal and further disrupt global supply chains, or that a tsunami would take down the, 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 the reactor in Japan, you know, and these things happen. And it just reminds again with the pandemic, you, you should invest in a way that's robust to the unexpected. So it's just, it's really been a great lesson. Um, and if you don't mind me saying another lesson that just is at home again. So the stock market and the economy are not correlated. You can't look at what's going on in the world or the economy or even geopolitically and say, now I'm going to make investment decisions. And, um, Three days after, in retrospect, what was the bottom? I wrote an article in Forbes and it was advice we were giving to our clients and reiterated with our clients that they're just not co correlated. And the, the point of the article was we're heading into a really bad recession. Unemployment was spiking. Um, uh, uh, the stock market was dropping. Everything just seemed horrible. But the point was, is you shouldn't sell out of your portfolio just because the news is bad and it's going to get worse because they're not correlated. And then what happened is, you know, we turned around and had a, you know, 70 some odd percent um, gain from about the time that I wrote that article. And what people have said to me is, um, Jennings, how did you know that we had bottomed? And I said, no, you don't understand. The point of the article is 
I didn't know and that nobody knows and you should invest like you don't know. And a challenge we have sometimes is talking to prospective client families that want us to give them the certainty of we know what's going to happen. And instead we say, we don't know what's going to happen and we're going to invest that way. And um, we, we find that our clients that are very sophisticated investment wise love that. And some investors that are less sophisticated, you know, don't choose us. They, they want to go to the big, you know, bank or investment firm that says, you know, here's our chief strategist and, you know, the S&P is going to be up 14% this year and blah, 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 blah. And they like that certainty because as humans, we don't like uncertainty. And if somebody says, I know what the future is going to be, we get this dopamine rush and we're like, we feel good. So again, I'm just like, bah, 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 bah. sorry. That's quite a right. Fascinating answer. Um, when you are not serving as president, what do you, I know that you are an avid reader what are a couple of the best books you've ever read that had the biggest impact on your career? So, you know, The Black Swan by Nassim Tlaib had a huge effect. I read that shortly after it came out in, in 2007. I'd like to say that I read it and was like, oh my gosh, I see, you know, 2008 coming, but at least, at least, at least opened my eyes to it. And it really in the last few years, one of the books that has, you know, just, I was just like, wow, it just really, you know, knocked me. I was like, I've learned so much and, and really caused me to see the world a bit differently. There's a book called Scale by Jeffrey West, who was a um, physicist at Los Alamos and then went over to the, the Santa Fe Institute and was the head of the Santa Fe Institute. If you don't know what the Santa Fe Institute is, it's a, a academic think tank and their, their main area of research is complex adaptive systems. It's how things interact when you have intelligent agents and feedback loops and everything, which is really how the stock market works, by the way. Why we, that's why we can't predict it. Um, but this book is all about scale, like power laws. It's on about organisms and businesses and things. And, and what a power law really is, is uh, I'll use an example of, um, let's, let's use the example of book sales. So you can look and say the, you know, that there's, you know, how many every books published in the U.S. every year, it's, you know, hundreds of thousands. And you can say the average book, you know, sells 10,000 copies. And if you think in terms of a bell curve, you're thinking, oh, you know, there's, you know, kind of, if you're listening, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm like drawing a bell curve with my hands, the, the, yeah. you know, some high and some low, but a lot are around the 10,000. 10, That's not how it works. You have people like Stephen King and J.K. Rowling and you know, you have this very small percentage of authors that sell a ton of books and then it drops off immensely. We have this very long tail of most books selling, you know, less than 2000 copies, less than a thousand copies. So that's a, that's a power law distribution or think about wealth. So, you know, if you take a, uh, you know, you go to a concert venue that has like 2000 people in it and you go, oh, okay, the average income of these, or that let's say the average wealth of these people is, you know, $250,000 if you average everybody. And if you think bell curve, you're like, oh, okay. But imagine if, you know, Bill Gates walks into the room. Okay. The average just skyrocketed and it doesn't tell you anything about what everybody else has. And, and that's the way wealth works in America too is at every stage, you know, you look at the top 50 versus the low 50 and then the top 10%, the top 1%. At every stage, there's a few number of people that are massively out of range that, that affect everything else. So this book is all about that. It is, it's a little technical. Like I've, I've talked before about how much I like this book and I've had people that have like, I couldn't get through it. So if you want to just really expand your mind, but it's work, Scale by Jeffrey West. Great recommendation. Yeah. Patience, fascinating interview. Uh, anything else you want to share that we didn't think to ask you yet? Well, I would just like to, if I could, plug my blog. Of course, please. Yeah. So I write a, a, a blog a few days a week. It's called The Interesting Fact of the Day. It really should be called What Jennings Thinks is Interesting. But um, I get, I, uh, you know, it's, it's very well received and um, it's just all sorts of different things. Some, sometimes it's things on leadership. Sometimes it's as simple as it's National Grilled Cheese Day. You should go eat grilled cheese and you know, today's uh, I sent out as a rerun because my daughter grads, graduates from college tomorrow and it's on the five best commencement speeches. So it's just a lot of different um, eclectic thing. You can things you can find it at uh, the T.H.E. IFOD, which stands for interesting fact of the day. So T.H.E. I.F.O.D. dot com. Uh, feel free to subscribe. Feel free to unsubscribe. Um, but just me. You know, I find that people say that it kind of kind of tickles their interest in things. So. 
All right. Well, this has been Seth Green with John Jennings of the St. Louis Trust Company. John, thanks so much for joining us. Seth, thank you so much. Thanks, everybody, for watching or listening. We'll see you next time.